So, Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November the 24th, 1946. He was actually an illegitimate child. His mother gave birth to him in the Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers in Vermont before his grandparents adopted him, and his mother raised him with his stepfather later, um, telling Ted that she was his sister for quite a while. It wasn't until a cousin told him to seek out his birth certificate and mocked him as being a bastard child that he found that he'd been lied to. So that's an early onset trauma. Um, the mother moved to Washington in 1950 to live with an uncle who was a music professor before his mother married Johnny Bundy, a cook in the military hospital nearby, and moved into a more working class neighborhood. The mother had told Liz Kendall on the flight home from Bundy's Utah kidnapping trial that she never told Ted about his adoption because she thought he had stuck his hand in the wedding cake and remembered it. Upon finding his birth certificate, she told Ted that his father was an unnamed World War II veteran who was uh, in the Navy but never came back to visit. The man who was assigned on Bundy's birth certificate as his father, Lord Marshall, was a salesman and an Air Force veteran, but Bundy's mother made claims that she was seduced by a sailor named Jack Worthington, but after investigations were made, there was no record of anyone by that name in the Navy or in the Marine Archives. An aunt has since suggested that his grandfather, Samuel Cow, was also his father. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know that. No, lots of people don't. Lots of people have dug into his history and seem to explain this as a possible reason for his low impulse control. Um, though I wouldn't suggest incest does explain away his, well, often myth-made good looks. But um, <laughs> yeah, there are definitely some Chinatown-style vibes going on in this family, unfortunately. There are suggestions that Bundy was also possibly molested by his grandfather and his peers during school or uh, scout camp outings, which might have skewed his sexual crimes later in life. Uh, at age three, Bundy actually laid butcher's knives around his sleeping aunt while she was in bed. He also set tiger traps where one girl fell into them and um, damaged her leg, and they were, he would put the stakes down there like he's part of the Viet Cong and cover them over with vegetation, so he was using his time in the scout camps for particularly dangerous ends. Um, Bundy was a boy and he enjoyed buying mice from a pet shop. Apparently his former defence attorney, John Brown, said he'd go into the woods and build a little corral and decide which ones to kill and which ones to let go. He sounds like the protagonist from the Wasp Factory. Uh, he doused a cat in lighter fluid and hung it from his backyard clothesline before burning it to death. And then later, he was uh, bullied in high school for a speech impediment before going to the University of Washington to study Chinese. There, he seemed to break through of his chrysalis and evolve into a new social class. He dated a wealthy Californian heiress called Diane Edwards. Edwards called the relationship off later, sensing Ted couldn't get any further than what his bluff and bluster had, had got him into, and uh, his subsequent victims all looked like his ex-girlfriend. They had long, shoulder-length brown hair, parted in the middle, white, about 17 to 24, other than Kimberly Leach, who was his youngest victim later on. He then moved from Seattle, Washington to Utah for law school and was baptised, of all things, into the Mormon church. Uh, <laughs> and later, 30 to 40 members of that congregation sent him a letter while he was in prison saying that they prayed for him and that he was definitely innocent. He then worked for Utah Republican Governor Dan Evans and was allegedly involved in Watergate, <laughs> of all things. Uh, he apparently worked for Donald Segretti and he went in disguise to Democrat campaign events, quote, like a chameleon, to steal from the headquarters and spy on the opposition. He was even interviewed about this and played down his role. And he said, oh, I'm actually frankly embarrassed that all the media attention is on me. So he has a, a really strange place in political history. Um, he was also living and killing in Utah. Um, and uh, they tried to the Mormon church then tried to obfuscate for his trial, um, saying that he wasn't guilty of Carol de Ronch, and lots of the women also made uh, propositions at him. Oh dear. Yeah, so we're seeing how even in a close-knit community, um, that doesn't put many women off, particularly if you are perceived to be slightly nice. Speaking of his long-term female companion, the most notable one is obviously Liz Kendall, whose book I have beside me. She says that Bundy was well-dressed, spoke clearly with an almost British accent, and had an immaculate student room, could cook, and was beloved socially by her friends and family. She met him in 1969 in a student bar. Um, Liz was a single mother. She'd had a high school sweetheart, then a short-term husband. She was a few years older than Bundy, and Liz... Uh, sympathetic though she is, considering she went through major trauma with Bundy, you can also see how he preyed on someone vulnerable because Liz subjected her daughter to a carousel both before and after Bundy of short-term boyfriends who would come in and out of her life and that was obviously partially due to her not being able to form long-term attachments and that's clearly another marker that many vulnerable women can fall prey to men like Bundy who have these psychopathic tendencies. Um, Apparently, after two years together, Liz tried to pressure Bundy into marrying him, 
uh, marrying her. He originally had a marriage license and tore it up in an argument. She then facetiously suggested an open relationship, and Bundy said, well, I can't stop you from seeing other men, which made her incredibly jealous, and they had this on and off again dynamic. So uh, That is a, quite a manipulative thing, because him not caring, of course, is kind of suggesting, well, you can do what you want, I don't really care that much about you, which, of course, elevates his status, and if she's drawn to that, which it seems mm. like she probably was if she reacted in that way, then it's a way of guaranteeing her um, sort of dedication. Yeah. Know? Cements the codependency. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Because the opposite of hatred is uh, not love. Uh, the opposite of love is apathy. And so if he didn't reciprocate her emotional outbursts, she was a, an alcoholic. She was um, hit him a few times. She used to scream and cry during arguments. And apparently, according to her, other than one instance where he threatened her, uh, he was very calm and rational in disagreements. Obviously, a very stark contrast with his violent outbursts and murders mm. later on. She wasn't getting the uh, emotional high that she needed to almost affirm her, her devotion and her insecurity. There's a passage from Notes from Underground that I covered with Nick, and it says about women who start arguments just to know their men still care. Liz very much came across as that. I'm not trying to criticise Liz here, obviously what she went through was horrific, but Bondi was very manipulative in not reciprocating her emotional advances, mm -hmm. um, even though he was not very well emotionally well, contained mean, himself later it, on. It could be explained by just saying that, you know, he, he could have been a psychopath, he, he couldn't really form a, a genuine close connection, so it could be that he wasn't necessarily trying to manipulate her, but the effect was still the same. Mm. He did actually say... Uh, at one point that he had trouble forming relationships. So he's quite self-conscious of it. And so I, I have, I suppose, a working theory that wasn't necessarily always a, a facade to appear very um, controlled and cordial, but he, he sort of struggled with it. Again, not excusing it. But um, there was a point, actually, I believe it's... I can, if I see if I can remember, I think it was page 121, if you just let me briefly flick to it, um, where he talks about... It was after his capture. He is, hang on a moment... Um, he said, yeah. So when Ted had court dates in Salt Lake City, he said that being Ted Bundy in public was just too hard. If he relaxed and was normal, people said he was putting up a good facade to hide his weirdness. If he got upset and irritated with the press or the police, people said that he was evil. If he was jovial, people said that he thought the idea of murder was funny. So he could never really understand how his emotions fit. And he was always very conscious of the public perception of, of how he he came across. Um, Liz and Ted actually didn't have any kids. She got pregnant once and she then had an abortion. She blamed his career ambitions for the abortions. And that was a, another point of contention. He actually, during Christmas of 1973, was spending time with Liz and Molly Kendall and then disappeared and not, without informing her, struck up a relationship with a woman named Susan, an ex-girlfriend, got engaged to her and then split up with her over an argument of abortion after Liz had, had aborted his child and flew back without ever telling Liz. So he had multiple women on the go. So again, it speaks to his ability to charm and disarm. Um, throughout his relationship with Liz, she also didn't really suspect this as a sign of psychopathy, but he stole things pretty frequently, like pairs of ski boots or all of her daughter's Christmas presents. Seems very what? impulsive. She said, oh, this isn't very becoming of a possible Republican politician. This could come back to bite you. There's actually a line in the book where she says, I didn't have moral opposition to it. It was just I thought it would su he would suffer from it his career down the road, but I didn't think that this was a sign of him being unstable. Yeah. Right. Very strange. And then the strange thing is as well, um, for someone who seems to be quite disconnected from his emotions, there are passages in here where you'd often like break down and cry in front of Liz, but it would seemingly be over menial things, like, oh, I don't know if I can stay in law school. But then she later realised that lots of these outbursts, where she mothered him and cradled his head and lulled him to sleep, would coincide with the murder dates. So, yeah, that suggests a hell of a lot of instability and possibly some, mm. some more conflict and a weird amount of self-awareness. I mean, I've seen John Wayne Gacy, for example, and he showed zero remorse long after the killings, whereas Bundy at the time seems to be at least a little bit conflicted. Again, not excusing anything that he did. Speaking of the victims, um, he said, confessed to killing 36 women. I suppose it's only apt or respectful that we actually read out their names, considering the story shouldn't be all about him. Um, Linda Ann Healy, Donna Gail Manson, Susan Elaine Rancourt, Roberta Kathleen Parks, Brenda Carol Ball, George Ann Hawkins, Janice Ann Ott, Denise Mary Nasland, Nancy Wilcox, Melissa Ann Smith, Laura Ann Aim, Carol DeRonch, who was kidnapped and not murdered, Deborah Jean Kent, Caroline Campbell, Junie Cunningham, Denise Lynn Over uh, Oliverson, uh, Melanie Cooley, the suspected, Lynn Dawn Cul uh, Culver, 
Culver, yeah. Culver, Susan Curtis, Margaret Elizabeth Bowman, Lisa Levy, and Kimberly Diane Leach. Survivors also include uh, Yoni Lenz slash Karen Sparks, depending on her pseudonym now. You can understand why she would want to change her name. Rhonda Stapley, which is contested because her story doesn't always add up. Um, Karen Chandler, Kathy Kleiner, and Cheryl Thomas. The estimates, however, are about as high as 100, and Bundy didn't confess right until the last week of his life because he hoped drawing out the confession would get him off death row. He was actually confessing to murders as they were walking him down the hallway from his cell to Old Sparky in Florida, so we'll never know how many. Many bodies still weren't even found. Um, he confessed to burying George Ant Hawkins' severed head, but they still didn't find the skull, so a lot of... Families won't get closure upon that. Um, he apparently told State Attorney Ken Katsaris that by the time you catch the man who did this, this is back before he was actually convicted of any of these, he will be responsible for murders of women in the three digits in six states. And reminder as well, anyone who um, lionises Ted Bundy as a charmer of women, his last victim and his youngest was Kimberly Diane Leach, who was 12. He snatched her from school. Uh, it was the same age of Molly Kendall at the time, who's reportedly you know the sort of surrogate stepfather for of. And uh, as when it comes to Maury, Molly, she played na- uh, games of naked hide and seek with her when her mother was out the house. So again, the guy was just a paedophile and absolutely evil. Um, when his car was searched after a routine traffic stop in Utah for running two stop signs, they found a, a library of majorette magazines, so young girls in cheerleading outfits. So despite the sort of fetishism of him by the present, he Again, violent paedophile. They also found a bunch of burglary items, which is what he was originally charged with. A traffic violation, then possessing items for burglary, and then Carol DeRonch's kidnapping when he was picked out of a lineup. Um, he was also suspe- suspected he was responsible for the murder of an eight-year-old when he was about 14. So that might have been his first. There's been some retracing here. Uh, a woman named Becca Morris has said, by age eight, Ted was killing animals. Um, by age 14, when Ann Burr disappeared, he was prowling neighbourhoods peeping through windows and stealing. At age three, he was putting knives around a sleeping aunt, um, and he was really delighted in that. And in 1987, Bundy had apparently offered a hypothetical confession and said uh, he and Beverly Burr and Burr's mother were corresponding. He denied it in letters to her, but he did sort of hint at the fact that he might have killed the missing child. So he might have started this you know, rampage of murder right from when he was really young. Um, the the reason he was so successful is he, he was actually luring women to his car fairly voluntarily. So he, with Carol Durant, she pretended to be an authority figure, a police officer, even though he was drunk at the time, with uh, Janice Art and Denise Nasland, he had a plaster cast on his arm. That's what inspired um, the plaster cast on Buffalo Bill's arm in Silence of the Lambs, for example, mm. loading a sofa in the back. And then with George Ann Hawkins, he was actually using a pair of crutches, which... Um, Liz spotted in his room at one point and he just waved it away and she didn't suspect it even though it was a detail put out in the case. So he was often seen as uh, either injured or just charming generally and would invite the women back. Um, Though there is some questions about his intelligence, of course, because when at the Lake Sammamish incident where he abducted Nasland and Ott in the same afternoon, he gave his name as Ted to them. Which seems pretty stupid to me to say because, of course, he didn't know the, the ultimate outcome of that. No, uh, and therefore he would be taking a risk. But then, maybe he assumed that it was like a double bluff, where he gave that name, and therefore it's probably not that name. Yeah, but in a very public park, doing a, and this is what originally, eventually brought him down because Kendall saw the composite sketch and thought, "Oh my god, that looks like my boyfriend." I'll call the Seattle Police Department. Um, if people in a public park are able to see you and overhear you introducing yourself as Ted, a sketch of your face and the name Ted is going to get you caught and ultimately it mm. did so again there are questions about impulsivity intellect all these things surrounding his his sort of myth um, then there's the more disconcerting parts bundy also practiced necrophilia he revisited the burial sites to observe the decomposition he cut the heads off he shampooed their hair painted the fingernails of the bodies and then sometimes kept the severed heads on him and at one point burned the skull of one of them in liz's fireplace and hoped she didn't notice which is just awful so yeah, I suppose we right. get on to the, the better news, where he was captured, detained, and, and prosecuted. As I said, he was originally just caught for a traffic violation in Utah before being put in a lineup, and Carol Deranch picked him out almost immediately. His parents bailed him from jail, and Bundy then published an open letter in the press protesting his innocence, which was replied to with many supportive letters, including those from the Mormon Church. On October 1921, 1976, Bundy was charged with the murder of Karen Campbell and actually extradited to Colorado, because um, in Aspen... Uh, There was a ski resort. He was seen around there at the time because when they raided his Utah apartment, they found gas receipts. They also found a hair in Bundy's car and all of the 
um, once they found Campbell's body, they found signs of struggle. So they thought, oh, the burglary equipment might have all added up there. So he was extradited on the first degree murder charge. He then escaped the Colorado jail because he decided to be his own defense attorney and they let him have access to the law library. And so he just opened the window and jumped out. <laughs> and he spent about six days in the wilderness and oh, then they, they captured him again. Well, it was eight days, actually. He then escaped the next Colorado jail again because he starved himself down to the point of where he could crawl through the light fixture and just fled to Florida. And he was on the run for a very long time. And that's why he did the ultimate killings, which brought him down at the Chi Omega sorority house and also Kimberly Leach's abduction um, because he fled to Florida, took the ID of a guy called Kenneth Meisner, who he originally posed as, and then broke into the Chi Omega sorority house to beat two women over the head with an oak log, um, beat up another two women and attempt their murder, and then... Uh, beat another woman in a neighbouring house afterwards. Talking of matters of intelligence, you'd mm. think that if he's just escaped two prisons or two jails, um, it is a difference. But you'd think he'd keep his head down, but apparently it, his compulsion seems to have taken over there. Yeah, well, he actually once spoke to Liz and framed it in terms of her alcoholism. He said, just like you're an alcoholic, I have a sickness too and I can't be around it. It being girls that looked very much like his ex-girlfriend as well. So it seems to have been a sexual revenge fantasy in, in many respects. The the one completely outside the norm is, of course, Kimberly Diane Leach, um, who he picked up from school, having stolen a Florida State University van, abandoned the van near a pig shed, and they found her body later, which is just... It's inexplicable, and that's one of the ones he would never be able to talk about. Um, again, it just shows a completely irrational, evil compulsion. But those were the only murders he was actually charged with. So even though there was the Aspen case pending, he was only actually trialed for the two Chi Omega sorority house murders, the two other attempted murders, and Kimberly Leach's murder, which was much later, and he received three death penalties for those. Um, it was actually the first court case to be televised in the US. The gallery was packed by about 250 reporters from five different continents. He eventually blamed his impulse to kill on porn and the EC crime comics at the time that were censored by the Comics Code because they were all women in bondage, being cut up. and Okay, I've read plenty of comics. It didn't drive me to that. I can actually agree with him, possibly, on, on pornography, driving you to be uh, more sexually depraved, but it doesn't make you a, a serial killer, I would say. Um, he then told the prison warden... Uh, I've already covered that. I apologise. Um, he often talks about the murders later to FBI investigators in the third person, and he told uh, Stephen Mickard, who was a, a investigator, he was 99% a normal guy, but there was just this 1% that liked to bash girls over the head. Not particularly excusable, is it? But he was actually instrumental in later catching the Green River Killer with uh, Robert Keppel and Dave Reichert, who partially with Mindhunter was based on. So, after he was convicted for those killings, um, the trial and subsequent appeals against his death row sentences cost the US taxpayer $9 million. Um, he filed a death row appeal on the grounds of ineffective provision of counsel, even though he was his own defence by dismissing <laughs> all of his other lawyers, because he gave it drunk and then later mental incompetence, but at the time before he had already said, I'm entirely mentally competent to do this and it had been ruled on, so those didn't work. The most disturbing thing that was in favour of the mental incompetence one was at the Kimberly Diane Leach trial, he married his girlfriend on the stand, not Liz, who had abandoned him by them, but um, Carol Boone, another one of his flames, who had come to his defence and showed up all the trials and protested his innocence, who we'll see on, in footage later. As his character witness, after he'd already received two death sentences, and at the murder of the 12-year-old girl, he exploited a loophole where, in the presence of a judge, if you declare your vows, you can be married, de facto. And he just asked her on the stand as he was cross-examining her, do you love me? Yes. Will you marry me? Yes. And I hereby marry you. And the jury did not take too kindly to that, slapping him very quickly with a third death penalty, because that was obviously <laughs> insane. Um, Boone basically defended Bundy up until about a year before his death. She smuggled drugs into prison with him and uh, even bribed a guard so they could have a conjugal visit and conceived a daughter with him. So he is survived by a daughter named Rose Bundy. Oh, dear. Yes, you can only imagine her life is, is very difficult. He was executed on January 24th, 1989 via Florida's old sparky electric chair. Apparently he has one of the longest recorded execution times. He took 12 minutes of full current. And I assume it's because they didn't wet the head as well, so it must have been very painful. Everyone in the room said you could just smell burning flesh for ages. A female executioner actually carried out the deed, so that's quite a <laughs> nice bit of irony, isn't it? Um, so 
during right before his death, uh, he was assessed by a psychologist, and he was he had an interview with a, a preacher that was televised, which you can watch in the description. But the psychiatrist who said um, he suffered from split personality bo- disorders and bipolar disorder after he was dead, even though his skull partially caved in because the amount of current, they they tried to look at his brain and assumed it just had some kind of chemical imbalance. They found completely normal just like John Wayne Gacy no legions mm-hmm. no injuries no deformities so it's just purely a, a personality problem or perhaps a voluntary well, choice it, it, it wouldn't be if they didn't find anything physically wrong with the brain mm. it, it's just that there wasn't any brain damage to yeah. influence his behaviour it doesn't mean that his brain necessarily functioned normally because clearly, no, clearly it didn't not. yeah but he had no um, injuries which exculpated him from it being a, some mm-hmm. form of choice because there are cases where people have got brain injuries that have changed their personality and that's something that's really well documented that if you have a physical brain injury it can change how you conduct yourself it's theorized you know um charles bronson is in yes. the, the the criminal yeah um it's theorized that uh, a, a bottle to the head was what um turned him violent before right. that point that's very interesting he, he apparently wasn't violent although we, we can't really know no. can't go picking around his brain because he's still alive yeah well Gacy tried to blame his killings on falling off a swing as a child but again his brain's in a jar on some Chicago psychologist's home just floating on a shelf and she said yeah there's nothing psychopathic wrong there. in and of itself isn't yeah it? it's very strange <laughs> I would not want a, a brain in a jar anywhere near me to no, be honest it, it seems a little bit strange to. yeah forgive the turn of phrase it's not exactly a conversation piece it's more of a conversation killer 